I'll go ahead and get started now. Um, this is uh, multi-factor authentication for the cloud. My name is Dustin Kirkland. I'm the CTO at Gazang. Uh, I used to be uh, self-conscious about this, uh, this first slide, but um, it turns out many people haven't heard of uh, Gazang yet, so I'll go ahead and lead with it. Uh, we're a small startup based in Austin, Texas, venture funded. Uh, we're focused specifically on encryption and key management. Uh, what originally was for the cloud, but it turns out uh, there's quite a bit of opportunity now around big data. Uh, the more data that there is out there, the, the more, uh, more often we see private information that needs to be secured and keys managed for it. Uh, we have packaged solutions uh, protecting Hadoop, Cassandra, MongoDB, OpenStack, a number of other uh, different, uh, different, different big data and cloud platforms. Um, but for the for the most part, we can run on on any Linux uh, in any Linux distribution. <clears throat> um, we are active in various open source communities. We're a, a new member of the Linux Foundation, um, and what we're ultimately doing, we're helping our customers secure their their most sensitive data at rest. <clears throat> So first of all, uh, authentication. Before we talk about multi-factor authentication, let's talk about authentication. At its most basic, it's really the act of confirming the identity of uh, purported by a person, or in software terms, often a program, um, by using something that it has, knows, is, or does. Um, from, a, from a has perspective, we're all familiar with showing our, our ID or our passport at the uh, uh, within at the airport or at the DMV, um, that's something that you have. You have this credential that supposedly there's only one of, that it's hard to fake. It was issued by a, a trusted uh, authority. Uh, from a software perspective, that might be a token or a certificate, a private certificate. Um, something that someone or something knows is the traditional passphrase or pen or the, the pattern you use to swipe on your phone. Uh, there's two other forms of, uh, of authentication that's often used, something that someone is or does. I'm not going to talk about those here, really. That's not very cloudy. It's, it's, it's very difficult for uh, a program to simulate or have a fingerprint or DNA or a retina. Really, that just comes down to it being a, a private certificate or a private passphrase. Um, the same goes for, for, uh, for does, a challenge response or spoken pattern. Moreover, and this is maybe a, a personal, um, more of a personal opinion, but I really don't think that that fingerprints or DNA or retinal scans are very good forms of of authentication. Um, this is just a small tangent to the side, but uh, for me, it's very important that uh, the piece of information you're using to confirm your identity is something that can be changed and rotated. Should your fingerprints become compromised, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to change your fingerprints or your your retina. Uh, moreover, your fingerprints are, are all over the place. They're, my fingerprints are on this glass right now. I, I don't do that with my passphrase. Um, I tend to think of a fingerprint or a retina, that's more of a username, not a, not a password, right? Um, I'm perhaps willing to share, as much as I'm willing to, to share the, my fingerprints on this glass, my, my username, um, but that, that's not enough to uniquely identify a person. So just as a, a, you know, an aside from the current discussion, Think real hard before you introduce bio, biometrics into an authentication system. So that's basic authentication. Uh, what about multi-factor authentication? How and why is it different? Um, you may also hear this called two-factor authentication. I prefer to call it multi-factor uh, authentication because it can be any combination of the has and knows and is and does. It can be any number of things. It can be multiple haves that are required. It can be some combination of haves and, and knows. Um, I also often shorten it to multi-factor auth um, because there is, as we'll get to in, in the end, a bit of a difference between multi-factor authentication and multi-factor authorization. Uh, and that's, that's two very different acts. Um, so, you know, the, the, the goal with multi-factor auth is to significantly reduce the risk of authenticating a false identity, a uh, false entity, someone or something purporting to be uh, the identity that it's trying to authenticate into. Um, and, uh, you know, it does this by increasing, vastly increasing, if you use, you know, these in the appropriate combinations, increasing the landscape of resources that have to be compromised in order to perform that, that authentication by a false entity. 
while still making it possible for the true entity to be able to, to authenticate. Um, you know, the, the, the images here have the fingerprint and the retinal scanner. Um, as mentioned previously, maybe not the best idea, but you, when used in combination with other things, it can really increase the, the amount of effort your attacker might need to, uh, to spend um, uh, in, in trying to falsify that authentication. If you've seen Mission Impossible, um, Tom Cruise's character, Ethan Hunt, goes through more than, a, more than a little bit of effort to break into the CIA and, and log in with a five-character password, um, <laughs> which is always, always amusing to watch in retrospect. So when is multi-factor off in the cloud, as, as is the topic of this discussion, when is it essential? Um, you know, there's a lot of places where I'd argue that it's, uh, it's important or essential. Um, in, in our organization and in many of the organizations that are our, um, our customers or partners, it tends to be in mission critical and production systems, especially when the data that is being guarded is private or in a regulated environment. Um, quite often that's in, in government, uh, healthcare, financial, uh, or even academic. There are laws that protect the records of minors, uh, especially in, in student records. Um, and then I would say essential in internet facing systems. Um, you know, we think about, I've been in, in, in Linux security for uh, over a decade and uh, some of that time has been spent in sysadmin roles and we spent, uh, you know, all the vast amounts of effort that we put into keeping, uh, keeping machines from being internet facing, keeping those systems from being on the edge and having, being able to open up uh, ports on the internet and now uh, for 10 cents an hour and within the next 30 seconds you can have dozens of them <laughs> with public IP addresses and, and ports open all over. Um, so think real hard about uh, about multi-factor auth in internet facing environments. Uh, multi-factor authentication is already supported by a number of, of popular services. Just to mention a couple, this is hardly a comprehensive list and uh, I'll get into a bit more specific and some of these, you know, can be argued how, how cloud are they, but that's just the, the ubiquity and the broad, uh, the breadth of the, the term cloud now. Um, certainly Amazon, AWS, there's a multi-factor authentication feature. Uh, you, can, you can enable this and then hook up uh, Google Authenticator or a Gemalto or a RSA uh, key to your AWS account or accounts. And in many cases, those are required for production systems. Uh, that can guard the access to the, the web console, launching of systems, other privileged operations. Uh, the Google Authenticator is also very, very popular, easy to use with Google services. Um, it's, it's not very difficult to set up. Uh, it does impact your user experience, I, I'll, I'll warn you. Um, having to have your, your phone up and running and hooked up to uh, Google Authenticator every time you do something uh, you know, that requires authentication with Google it's unbelievable how many times per day um, that, that might come up. It's also really con inconvenient when you reinstall um, Cyanogen on your phone and you uh, dropped your, uh, <laughs> your Google Authenticator token. It's a bit of a manual process to uh, reset that appropriately, and for good reason, obviously, right? There's always a sliding scale with security. There's uh, hyper secure, but uh, very difficult to use, and then there's extremely usable, but you know, lacking all security. You need to so to find the, the place on the dial that makes the most sense for a given environment. Um, Dropbox has a, what they call it, I try to use the, the terms that each of these, you know, if you were to, to, to search for uh, any of these, uh, the terms that these, um, these companies use for their multi-factor authentication. Uh, but uh, Dropbox has a, a two-factor verification um, feature uh, where uh, access to certain files or objects in, in Dropbox uh, can be verified. Um, same with PayPal, you can actually order a physical uh, security key. It's, it's another one of these, I'm not sure who makes it, maybe Jamalto uh, makes the, the, the physical security key that gets used that uh, you know, is required to use your PayPal or, or eBay account. Um, and then Facebook recently implemented login approvals uh, for, for certain, you can set up your account to uh, require you to approve a login using SMS. Uh, which is perhaps better than nothing, but SMS has its own security uh, issues and considerations. Um, probably the most popular, the most well-known, is the time-based one-time passwords, the OTPs, as they're often called. Um, rolling tokens is maybe another word for it. 
it's actually extremely simple to implement. In its most basic form, um, this is three lines of shell code that will um, will very very quickly and conveniently implement a um, there's a character missing on, on got pushed to the next line there. I want to scale this to 10.24. Uh, this is a real simple example of how to do a time-based um, one-time password. Take a shared secret. You've got to get this shared secret on the, the two different places. You, you choose it sometimes. It's given to you other times. Uh, you take a timestamp. This is a real basic uh, Unix uh, epoch timestamp number of seconds since uh, January 1st, 1970. We're going to take the first nine digits of that, leave off the last one, which will give us basically a 10-second uh, one-time passphrase. So that changes every every 10 seconds. It, this is uh, this is decimal. Um, and then you concatenate that shared secret with that timestamps, perhaps run it through uh, an HMAC, um, and then I grab the first six characters from it. Um, that's extremely similar to what these dedicated devices are doing. All of them require a shared secret. Um, they require some amount of time-based synchronization. Um, now, for far more resilient and robust algorithms, have a look at these uh, Internet RFCs. Uh, the original one was 4226, an HMAC-based one. A uh, much more modern one is uh, 6238, which is what the Google Authenticator is based on. Uh, they're a bit more robust. They handle time drift, as you can imagine. Requiring two servers to be in or two systems to be in perfect sync uh, gets difficult over time. Um, so they have a, a way of um, basically resynchronizing itself and determining how far out of sync uh, they are. Um, and a couple of uh, not that I'm endorsing any of these products, I just stole their the images off the internet. But uh, the the classic RSA Secure ID, Jamalto, Authy uh, has a, a real interesting uh, app and. A uh, very small bit of shell code that you can put in your uh, SSH config command uh, and require an, an authy code every time you SSH into a system. And then, uh, of course, the Google Authenticator. So when can you use uh, multi-factor authentication? Um, fundamentally, in a Linux system, anywhere in the PAM stack, uh, you know, take a look at etsypam.d. And you'll see a number of different places that we've already hooked in Linux and the, within the authentication system that require or uh, define as sufficient uh, different pieces of information. Um, Linux is, is set up very well for multi-factor auth and has been for, for decades. Um, and some people have used it for decades. Um, but, you know, simple cases at login, desktop, or console. Uh, or SSH, it, it can be any one or all of those of those three. Um, at something like a password change event, that also goes through the the PAM stack, uh, and then uh, administrative tasks such as sudo or cron or, or at jobs. Um, in the or within the last year or so, Ubuntu implemented um, multi-factor authentication through the Google Authenticator. You can very easily set up either a desktop or a server um, to use the Google Authenticator where in addition to providing, first you provide your, your password, and then you have to provide the, the token that, that you get from from um, uh, from the Google Authenticator, uh, and that works just as well on, on Ubuntu servers. It's, it's actually pretty simple to set up for, uh, for any Linux system that supports PAM. So when is a multi-factor difficult? Well, it's reasonably straightforward when the authenticating entity is a human, right? And all of these examples we've shown the, the rolling tokens or, or some piece of some piece of hardware, a smart card or something that that someone has, right? Uh, and we know how to do that. We've been doing that for a while. It can actually be a bit more difficult when the entity is another program or a process or something else that's also <clears throat> in the cloud. So especially with the cloud, we're talking about automated processes, and we're talking about virtual machines where there's machine to machine communication, and often these are virtual machines, uh, and especially in between services. So I'm sure we've all seen the, the snippet of PHP or Python or Ruby code in a web app that uh, has a password that's embedded in the code somewhere and then passed in a connection string. I mean, that's the, that's the way we, we do things. If not that, then it's in a file and we uh, open that file, read it, and, and put it in there. But you know, fundamentally, that password lives on disk somewhere and has to be loaded into memory. 
Um, and that is what it takes to connect to, to MySQL. Um, perhaps that's the, the MySQL server has uh, some firewalling on it that requires an IP address, a whitelist, hopefully it's behind a, a VPC, and there are you know, some, some additional levels of, of protection. Um, but the, the, piece, the piece of authentication itself ultimately is a is password. Um, of course, we use extensively in cloud computing SSH and SSL, or hopefully we use extensively in cloud computing SSH and SSL. Um, but fundamentally, there's a, there's a private key that's stored somewhere that's, uh, that is used by SSH, in this case, in an rsync job that uh, at 4 a.m. Uh, every morning copies the logs off from, from this system to a, a backup system. Um, it's authenticated using that, that private key and only that private key. That's a, a single factor. It, it is strong encryption. Uh, you know, this could be a, uh, an, an RSA key 4K long. Um, it, you could use a strong algorithm, but there's still only a single single bit of information that is, that is required to perform that uh, authentication. In the lower example, that's a snippet of an uh, Apache configuration where there's a, an SSL certificate. That's, a, again, a, a file on disk, a private file on disk um, that's, that's required to uh, host that Apache service. Uh, a single authentication is required to start, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that, that single file is what's used to start Apache in, in SSL uh, mode. So I'd like to introduce a, a bit of a different concept here. and <clears throat> It's a concept that we call we know in, in modern uh, terms as a trustee. I can overhear a little bit of the conversation next door, and this guy evidently is a, an IP lawyer, so he could probably do a better job explaining a, a trustee. Um, but a trustee is a legal term. It's a person or an entity who has a position of responsibility to act on behalf or as an authority for others. Um, there's a lot of ways we can think about this, but at its most basic in you know the in a modern democracy, we elect leaders who make decisions on our behalf. We don't always agree with them. Perhaps we agree with them less than we would like to, um, but ultimately we're entrusting them to vote on our our behalf. And you know that's that's the the U.S. Congress in this case. But where does the term come from? The concept of a trustee as a voter was formulated by this guy Edmund Burke. Uh, he was a member of British Parliament in the in the 18th century. Um, he was also a philosopher and he wrote extensively uh, about uh, British politics and about uh, uh, just the philosophy of acting on behalf of others. Uh, but the modern term of a trustee being used in, a, in the sense of a voter comes from um, you know, this quote. Um, essentially, it's someone, typically someone, we're gonna talk about it as something, a, a computer program, but it's someone that considers an issue and after hearing all the sides of the debate exercises their own judgment and makes the decisions about what should be done in that case. So thank you, Mr. Burke. Um, but trustees, we also know from a different term, and we know trustees from the sense of a trust fund. The modern concept of a trust fund for property is actually much older than the concept of a trust fund from, from the sense of voting. Um, it actually developed in 12th century England. So once again, thank you, thank you, England. Um, here, you're welcome. Oh, sorry, <laughs> appreciate it, much appreciate it. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, in in 12th century England, during the Crusades, landowners, especially wealthy landowners, they would leave their property in the care of a of a trustee, so that when they left to fight in the Crusades. This trustee didn't own their property, but it was up to them to essentially bestow their will or exercise their will, passing it on to their, their beneficiaries, their, their children. Um, there's a actually kind of a funny scene at the beginning of, uh, of Robin Hood Men in Tights, the Mel Brooks movie, uh, which I debated. Mel Brooks or um, Paris and, and Nicole, uh, they won. Um, but in the beginning of Robin Hood Men in Tights, Robin Hood, uh, Carrie always comes back from the Crusades and they're hauling off his... Uh, Falling off his castle, and it had been entrusted, and well, you know, it's a comedy, so uh, it wasn't properly executed. But the concept of a trust, a trustee, in this sense, is someone who acts like voting, acts on behalf of uh, of the property that they're entrusted with. They don't own it; it's not theirs, but it's up to them to uh, to to make decisions 
um, as if uh, with that with the trust with the beneficiary's uh, interest at heart. So let's take these concepts and fundamentally apply that to uh, to software to a software system. So within um, this is a this is a product from from Kazang. We, we essentially have two products. One's an encryption product, the other one's a key management product. The real differentiator in our key management product is we've taken this concept of a, of a trustee and trustee voting and formulate, formulated that in, in terms of software. Uh, we've brought that and we're using that both for authentication and for authorization. Um, this enables a system administrator to delegate the approval of the release of information uh, to one or more uh, trustees. That uh, release of information could take any form. We treat it as an uh, opaque object. It's encrypted in a way that even we, we actually you know, are true to the trustee concept. We encrypt that data using the beneficiary's um, public key so that only the beneficiary's private key can decrypt it. Not even the trustee can see the information that's being entrusted to the, the Z trustee server. Neither the server, the one holding it, um, nor the, the trustee has or is privy to that information. Um, what they, what the trustee is allowed and enabled to do is decide whether or not that information should be released. So in, in practical terms, once again, we're talking about passwords or passphrases, um, private certificates, uh, private, private keys, uh, one-time passphrases or tokens, perhaps generated uh, objects. It can be files, and if it can be files, it can be tarballs, it can be collections of information. Um, there's a you know a couple of bits of vocabulary we use when we talk about this. One is a client. The client is the the, the piece of software that actually puts a deposit onto. Uh, we call them deposits. We try to use banking terms wherever possible. Uh, it's the client that puts the deposit into the Z Trustee server. When it does that, it actually at that time because it had access to that information at some point in time, that point in time, it defines the policies by which it can be released. And we support all the normal things you get out of a, a, a KMIP or a, um, a, a typical key server, such as uh, a TTL on the key, a limit to the number of times it can be retrieved. Uh, but we've also added this concept of trustees, where when putting the deposit, the client can define, well, zero, and there are no trustees, uh, or, but all the way up to N number of trustees. And those trustees can be humans, or they can even be programs. You can identify a trustee by an email address, or by uh, a GPG public fingerprint. Question? <laughs> Good question. Uh, it's uh, in the in every case I've ever seen. It's it's data. It's uh, it's strings. It's it's files. It's something that we uh, can can encrypt and base sixty four encode and insert into a database somewhere. I've never thought about it from a runtime sense. Interesting. What what would guard whether you can do that or not? Is it some bit of secret information that allows you to do that? Hmm. Sure. That's a that's a good question. I'm I'm intrigued. I don't think I quite see the connection yet, but I, I would like to talk about it more. Uh, so emails are the request to that to that email address. We can actually sign and encrypt the message to that email address. We always sign the message if we have the that email address. You know, in a in a production system where this is your system administrator. People have GPG keys that have been uploaded to the server. We actually encrypt the, that message and all messages when we have a public key on file to that address. And so we'll, we'll, we'll throw it out there, but only the person with that private key can, can decrypt it. Actually, both are supported. So. The, the, the ideal use case is we have public keys for everyone. We actually have a, a public key server that's part of, of Z Trustee. Uh, we started with the Debian SKS, uh, which is the, the synchronizing key server for PGP. We hit the limitations of that because we're running this in environments that may 
involved hundreds of thousands, uh, millions of, of clients, and scaling that SKS didn't work. So uh, we're actually working on a, a, an, a GPL v3 replacement for SKS called Hockey Puck, or HKP. Um, so there is a public key server component to this um, that's, that's required for all client-to-client -client communications. Every message between a client and a server, the programmatic sense, is signed and encrypted using, using GPG. That's how we do the authentication from clients to servers and servers to clients. Uh, but in the case where that's not available, we've also got a, um, a URL not space approach where much like, say, the, uh, the Facebook approach to, we'll just click on this link in this email. Uh, we do have, you know, time expiring, one time use not URL links where, you know, there are organizations that, I mean, GPG is frankly hard to set up and hard to get working. So b both are supported by default, everything signed and encrypted. Unless we can't do that, we fall back. Does that answer your question? So that trustee would, in the case where the nonce link is used, they would need to know the Z trustee server name, um, and they would need to guess or somehow intercept a 256-bit randomly chosen nonce. Um, if it's clear text email, that's that would be possible to, to scrape. If it's encrypted email, impossible to scrape. If you're not using the email-based approach, and I'll get to the different trustee interfaces in a second, then uh, it's, it's as impossible as brute, or it's as difficult as brute forcing a 256-bit nonce. That, that's actually, that's certainly not the optimal way to do it. We've got APIs in yeah, I'll show you in just a second. Uh, we've got APIs in Shell, Python, Java, and C, and all of those are over SSL links, number one, to prevent man in the middle. Number two, you go through uh, that API, and it will form a, let's see, the innermost packet is a bit of JSON. It, JSON contextual information, act on this. It's a REST-based approach. That JSON is then uh, signed by that client's public key, I'm um, sorry, private key, and then encrypt it to the server's public key. So now we've got this encrypted signed blob of JSON uh, data that is posted to the, the Z trustee server. The Z trustee server decrypts that data, and only the server with the private key can decrypt that data. It checks the signature, and using that, that signature check, it determines which client sent this information, uh, and then cracks open the JSON and performs whatever action is specified by, by that. Uh, it then concocts a response. That response is then um, signed by that server's private key and then encrypted to the client, um, uh, the, the, the client's public key. And then that goes back over to that client in SSL. There is that, that double encryption there. And, uh, you know, it, it, this is, it can be a, a CPU intensive uh, bit of work. Um, but, you know, that can certainly be mitigated. Does that help? Both, both, uh, both are doing it. The client and the server are both using uh, fundamentally GPG. Right. Mm. That's all right. No, it's it's a good question. So clients later uh, request the, that deposit. The client must be able to meet all of the defined policies. The server enforces that, and the trustees are uh, probably the, the most, um, are certainly the most uh, most flexible and extensible policy of, of all of them. The, the, the basic policies are the ones required by something like the KMIP, the Key Management Interoperability Protocol. Um, but uh, you know, the trustee can be you know anything that that you could possibly imagine uh, requiring. Um, so in a in a in a programmatic or a, a, I'm sorry, in a pictorial form, it looks like this. The, the clients here, one or more clients that are putting and getting this data to one or more Z trustee servers. Um, that Z trustee server decides if it can, uh, that client can meet all the policies defined for that particular deposit. And if that particular deposit requires trustees to vote, uh, the requests are, are sent out or made available for these trustees to then vote on up or down. And if that can be met, then that deposit's released back to the, the client. So in the in the GPG case, 
this is an example of the decrypted GPG message. It still has the, the, the signature here at, at the bottom. Um, but in, oh, that didn't work. Okay, in this case, uh, so this message is a cryptographically signed message. It says, hey, this is your, uh, this is your Z trustee server. Um, a managed client has authenticated itself. So that, that much you have to trust that the server has done a good job authenticating the, the client. Um, and uh, has requested the following deposit. And it's, this uh, has this handle and this description. That's just metadata that the client set whenever it created the deposit. Um, it provided the following explanation of this request. And this is a, a free form field that the client, when making the request, can, uh, can define. And this is called a justification. And this justification could just be uh, basic information. It could also include some, some sort of a, a challenge response or some other additional uh, bit of information. Um, in this case, inside of this uh, encrypted uh, signed email are two nonce links and these are when I said nonce links that's typically what it looks like and you know you've got all the usual limitations of a of a, a get based URL uh, but all the advantages of a get based URL um, and one of these is a an authorize a thumbs up another one's a deny thumbs down and each of these links can only be used one one time Any question Yes, absolutely. And this is a snapshot of uh, uh, the previous version. I took this from our from from the previous version. We now identify the client. We also include the host name, IP address, internal and external of the client, and put that in this message. Um, so hopefully that's a little bit better. If there, if you've got other ideas, yeah, we certainly could identify. We certainly can identify this client by. Uh, it's public fingerprint as well. Um, uh, just I'll take a mental note to add that to the to the metadata that comes back about the, the message. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear your, your ideas. So that's email. And it, this is uh, easy and simple for a demo, especially to a demo to some of the executives that I'll, I'll, I'll demo this to from time to time. Um, but any of us that you know have written to a REST-based API certainly knows that there's better ways of, of doing this. Um, I'll get to the REST based AMI uh, API next. But uh, once again, for demoing to execs, this is certainly the way everyone wants to see things, right? Write an app for it, create an app for it. So we've, we've created an, an Android app and we've got an iOS app in progress right now. Um, but it's a mobile interface. It's a, it's a push based notification um, interface where your, your mobile app, you then register to. Uh, one or more Z trustee servers. We always think about this as one or more clients registering for one or more servers. In this case, all the communication happens over SSL. It's authenticated. The packets are still encrypted, also using GPG, use Bouncy Castle in, in, uh, in Java and in, in Android to, to handle this, uh, whereas we use GPG2, uh, libgcrypt, and, um, and then on the programmatic on the server side. There's a bunch of screens. I only grab the one screen that's the vote up, vote down type interface. And this is you know, a basic deposit, and this would be the place to add more information about which client's making this this request. Uh, in this case, um, Casey could vote uh, up or down or abstain. The middle ones just kind of hide it and abstain uh, from from this vote. But I think the one that most of us here would be, in, at least to this crowd, I think would be interested in uh, is the the programmatic sense. I mean, I really want to to program trustees that that behave. Uh, the, and make those decisions. I, I want uh, to have, uh, you know, cron jobs or demons that are that are authorizing or denying requests based on perhaps the time of day. It's about a five-line Python script to uh, have a trustee that um, checks in every every sixty seconds and decides uh, if it's between one a.m. and two a.m. on the first Sunday of the month. Um, approve this request, or, or if it's not between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. on the first Sunday of the month, deny this request across across the board. In this case, this is a couple of lines of, of shell code. Uh, the Z trustee command itself uh, is uh, is just a, a bit of Python. Um, it's it's architected like Git, where the, the first argument's always a, an action, and then it's got a, a bunch of contextual uh, options after that. But the Z trustee pending command 
would show um, a, a JSON data structure of all the pending requests. And in this case, so to your point or to your question, uh, we have identified the client that's made the request. So that data is available. We just didn't expose it in the email interface yet. But we know the client fingerprint that's made the request. Um, we know the, 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 the email address or the text uh, associated with that uh, client. Um, we know when the request was created, uh, the deposit that it's been identified, the expiration of this request, and then some justification. In this case, uh, just for a, an example, we've put uh, where justification for one of our servers might require uh, the title of a Beatles song, for instance, and it's always kind of changing, but if I see a request that doesn't have uh, some bit of information that that reminds me of the Beatles. It's not a um, it's not a valid request, and that, that's from more of a human to human than, than a machine to machine. Um, but uh, it, you know, it's 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 a it's a form of a challenge response or a shared secret. Uh, this request has a UUID. Uh, this is uh, the role of trustee. There's a couple of different roles, but um, and everything we identify by these 256 bit of uh, single-use UUIDs. We base 62 and code them to make them a little more URL safe. Uh, and then there's an authorize and a deny command. The authorize command would uh, take that, that UUID and um, package it up into the, the way that encrypted signed JSON data blob is supposed to look for the server to, to respond to it. And it can mark that request as authorized or it can mark that request as denied. Um, I, had every intention on creating the same blob in Python, C, and Java, and I just didn't get around to it today. Um, but fundamentally, uh, import ztrustee and then uh, ztrustee.pending, blah. I mean, it's, it's going to look exactly like you'd expect in, in Python, C, or Java. Yeah, so when uh, a client makes a request, the default, if unspecified, the timeout is 12 hours. Um, but you can specify any timeout you want. You can say, make this request. I need a response in 60 seconds, or else I'm going to assume it's wrong. Um, it's, it's specified. At, at if, it, if the timeout's too, slow, too long or too short? Too short. Yeah, perhaps. Um, I mean, we scale pretty linearly with CPU, um, with, with CPU and, and disk I.O. It's not a very memory intensive operation unless your deposits are huge. We have put multi gigabyte deposits, but I mean, Dropbox is a better solution for that than or S3 than this. Uh, no, it's, it's actually multi threaded. Um, so on the Apache side or on the, on the server side, we're using Apache and Postgres. By default, uh, we actually use SQL Alchemy, so that SQL backend can be replaced. We test it with SQLite, MySQL, and Postgres. We've gotten the best scalability out of Postgres. Uh, it's an Apache web server. We've looked at Nginx, but so far Apache's done pretty well. Out of the box, it's about 100 connections, simultaneous connections it can handle. Um, using th There's three tweaks to make to scale that up. Uh, you increase the number of threads in Apache. Uh, it's a, Python WSGI module. Uh, you increase the number of threads in Apache, you increase the number of connections in Postgres, and you need to increase, uh, there's a syskittle, uh, sysconf that needs to be updated. I forgot which it is, but we've documented it in the server man page. Um, it's a, uh, and with that, we've taken it up to, I think, I think 10,000 simultaneous connections in the largest instance we could find in, in Amazon. Um, we're working on our clustered, sharded, high availability type solution where you could put these in multiple systems. We've got a design that works on paper and we're in the process of implementing that. That'll be, that's targeted at this summer, June, July. Excuse me. Please. Yeah, great question. I, I get to that toward the very end. Um, so I'll short circuit straight to that and then circle back. Uh, it's offered as a, a SaaS model, multi-tenant SaaS. It's offered as a private dedicated SaaS, and it's offered as an on-prem. And so far, 
the adoption has been mostly on the, the on-prem solution, which is the, the, the uh, you know, the, it's not unexpected, but I mean, that's, that's where people are deploying this and doing it internally. Absolutely. Uh, totally. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, security is a, is a funny field. It's real hard to get, um, to, to get, uh, and it's one of the real challenges, especially in a startup world. It's really difficult to have, um, uh, you know, advocates who publicly will, you know, jump up on stage and say, we use this, theory. you know, but it's just inviting trouble. So. Yeah, no, personally, I mean, I, I'm the CTO and architect of this software. I would much rather, not much rather, but I, I certainly like it when someone takes this and deploys it behind their own firewall, um, maintaining other people's deposits. It's something we do, but uh, you know, it's, it's, that's touchy. Yep. Yeah. So the first thing to understand, um, that's extremely important to this is that every single deposit that's put onto the Z trustee server is encrypted using the public key of the client that put it there. Okay. So even though the root administrator of the Z, Z trustee server can't read the data that's in the content column of the deposit table, the database. They could tamper with it. They could destroy it. Um, they could, you know, a root user could authorize releases. There's bad things it could do, but the data itself, to compromise that data would involve compromising both the client and the, the server, you know, obtaining the private key on the, the client and the server. Of course, you can put a passphrase on the GPG key on the Z trustee client, but that really hurts your, um, you know, that really makes it difficult to, to do any sort of machine to machine communication with. Now you also require a, a, a passphrase as well. There is one, one exception to what I said about everything's encrypted. There is, at a customer request, there is an optional feature. Any deposit can be defined as recoverable. So there is sort of an escrow mode for Z trustee where um, the instead of asymmetrically encrypting it using the client's public-private key pair, instead a shared secret is used, a shared uh, symmetric key is used, so that an administrator of the server could recover data. That's not the default. It requires an override on every single client that wants to put that data. It's not, you know, it's, we've tried to, anywhere we could have taken a secure approach, we've taken the secure approach and offered the less secure approach as an option. So, um, Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah, let me see. What do we have left? We have about 15 minutes, and I have a couple of slides, and then we'll open it up completely. So the voting policies. Here's a, a quick example um, what this looks like. Um, generate a password. This password never landed on disk. It went straight from memory, from PWGen, directly into Z Trustee. Uh, the Z Trustee put command, the dash C says the contents are dash standard input. And I've defined uh, three trustees. Uh, one is on call at example.com. Another one is sales at gazang.com, which is who you'll contact if you want to know more about Z trustee. And the third is actually identified by uh, a fingerprint. We identify um, clients, trustees, processes. Anyone can be identified that has a fingerprint on file can be identified by their full fingerprint. We only use, uh, we always use this canonical form which is the, uh, the bit length, or the key length, the algorithm, and then the full 40-bit key. There is actually some attack service now for, um, for uh, key collisions in, in GPG, especially if you just use the short key. We always use the full fingerprint, the key length, and the, uh, and the algorithm. Um, a subsequent get of that, I, that, uh, that deposit, and this one's identified by its, its UUID, instantly puts this shell command into a, a waiting uh, poll. Um, until, and it will check back with the server on a, a slow back off um, for up to 12 hours by default. You can always overwrite that, that timeout. Um, but it'll put this into a poll, and the server will not release that deposit until those two, um, two, those two votes are, are acquired. So there were three trustees. Two of the three have to approve the release of this deposit. If any one denies the release before, the, before two have voted in favor of it, uh, one denial is considered authoritative. It has to happen before the, the sufficient number is reached. Um, 
And so in this case, this will sit until those two are retrieved. And I guess I forgot to copy and paste the actual uh, retrieval. But uh, assuming that the, the two um, email addresses are the client uh, authorizes the release, um, that deposit will come because it came went in on standard in. It's going to come back out on standard out. You can actually use files or, or directories as well um, with C trustee. So instead of standard in, you could give it a, a, a file path, um, which on a successful retrieval will unzip that into dev shm shared memory. You don't want to write it to disk, um, or you can specify a dash f and tell us where to put the file. Um, in another case, we've actually got a, uh, this is sort of a consumer of ZTrustee. We've written a C program called ZAuth, uh, which uses the C library for ZTrustee. So, you know, pound includes ZTrustee.h. Um, and what this ZAuth does is it actually adds the, the whole PAM authentication that I mentioned before and referenced uh, Randall's XKCD to make me a sandwich. Well, give me your authorization code. Um, and that's how, how ZAuth works. So you can actually add one or more trustees into Z off, and then you can add off sufficient or off that should have been required, um, excuse me, off required PAM Z trustee into anything in PAM. Um, in this case, this is sudo. And so sudo uh, apt get install, um, uh, you know, some program, and then with, depending on where you put it in the PAM stack, here I put it after common, uh, common off, um, then it would await Z trustee authentication, and that would be for anything that went through the sudo stack. Imagine the same thing for a screensaver, or for a login, or console, or, or SSH. <laughs> it might be, it, 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 but, but it could be programmatic. You know, that might not be a human that you're waiting on. It might just be a program making sure that you're inside of a maintenance window. You could block access to SSHN except for inside of a maintenance window and do that you know, pr programmatically with a separate system. So is this uh, something completely different? Um, the title of the talk was multi-factor authentication. The more I started uh, working on this particular expression of the idea, I've been talking about this idea for over a year now, but it's, it's actually more like multi-factor authorization. And I did, I did a little searching and I really didn't find anything uh, called multi-factor authorization. So that's why I'm, I'm trying to use multi-factor auth and shorten it and leave it as a mystery what, which one we mean. Um, but the, the key is that you know, any information object can be dynamically requested and retrieved from Z trustee. There are ways to protect data that has to stay local in the system. That's encryption. And, you know, we, we've got a whole other product suite based on encryption. Um, I co-author and I maintain eCryptFS, a cryptographic file system for Linux. There's dmcrypt. There are ways of protecting the data locally that has to be written to the local storage. But when you actually want to protect the data, uh, that, and you want to protect it by, instead of storing it local, Storing it remotely in a trusted service, a trust, uh, trusted um, you know, server, uh, and retrieve it dynamically, use it, and then discard it. You know, st only store it in, in um, M-locked uh, secure memory or something like that. Uh, this is a way of, of doing that. So, you know, getting to your question about the, the is it available as SaaS or on-prem? It's actually available as both. There is a SaaS service, but for anything other than a couple of deposits, we recommend either dedicated in the cloud or uh, you know ideally on prem uh, the server itself installs easily on ubuntu 1204 newer rel centos 6 slas 11 uh, it's uh, we've packaged everything as devs and rpm so it's an app get install or a yum install away um, the servers have you know sort of a, a limited footprint in terms of what's required there but the clients are available on on pretty much anything the, the python the c the java it's all extremely portable um, and anything that has a modern Python stack or a modern JVM can run this. Uh, and I even say hesitantly that Mac, Windows, and Android, well, Android especially, we've tested very thoroughly, but we've even done puts and gets on Macs and Windows using the, the Java client. Uh, so the client we look for, you know, sort of ubiquitous support. The server is kind of on a customer by customer basis. We did it on Ubuntu first, and then we got a customer who asked for RHEL. And we got a customer who asked for SLES, and that you know that that it kind of grew like that. Uh, it's it's across both Amazon and and Rackspace. We've got we've got failover. It's public cloud. Yeah, it's public cloud. Um, so that's me. You can find me uh, any any of these uh, any of these places, and I think we have uh, right at ten minutes left for for questions. Um,
Yeah, absolutely. I've already sent them to the presenter. I'll put it on my blog and, and read it out a bit later. Matt? Um, so the, the, the software is commercial software. So there's an all rights reserved at the top. Um, it's in Python. It's perfectly visible. We haven't obfuscated it. Uh, it's copyrighted, and that's our. Uh, it's not. It, I mean, that's a that's a commercial discussion. Um, I, I I know for this crowd, I would love to say that our clients are open source and the server is proprietary, or it's all open source, and we may get there one day. We're a small startup, and this is this is where we're at. Um, but uh, it's not obfuscated in any any way, shape, or form. Um, Send uh, send uh, patches, and I'm, I'd be more than happy to accept them. But um, yeah, it's 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 the Z trustee part of this is commercial. There there's quite a bit else in the presentation that is freely available. Um, some of the Authy stuff is kind of cool. Uh, Authy doesn't work at the PAM layer; it works only a, as an SSH config option. But that's another simple way of doing it. Um, most of the other services are commercial as well. Google Authenticator and AWS. So, great question. Yeah, we, we do. We work with uh, with SafeNet and Polis. Um, there's a couple of ways we actually can set, and this is this is kind of the default answer inside of the company. Whenever someone asks, "Can you do this?" Make a trustee out of it. So, what we've actually done is set uh, use the the HSM. Um, Java API and created a, a trustee out of an HSM. So you request a deposit, which is cached in, in this in this example. This customer is running in Amazon or something. And Amazon now has cloud HSM, but uh, before that happened, uh, you know this is a set, essentially a software version of an HSM. Something you store data there and you, you fetch data from. And someone said, "Well, can you integrate? I want the HSM to decide whether or not I get this data." Oh, okay. Uh, Oh, no, well, so the only thing that we've so far integrated with the HSM are the, the, the root of trust, fundamentally, because at the heart of a Z trustee server is a GPG private key, uh, an SSL certificate. The same things we're telling you put into Z trustee, well, it's got its own. Put it into another Z trustee and, you know, cross them together, or put it into an HSM. So we've got a, another, um, we've got another use case where a uh, customer is storing encrypted data in a public cloud. Uh, they run a Z trustee server in that public cloud, um, but store the the uh, store the private keys for the Z trustee server in an HSM in Europe, and so they sort of have this root of trust that ultimately requires, at some point, if they power down, uh, you know, some piece of the puzzle, it ultimately requires a connection back to the to their VPC or their VPN to their data center in, in Finland or something. Um, what that gives them the ability to do is pull up logs, but not every single request, and there may be thousands of them per minute, has to go through that VPN to an HSM, which is, uh, it, it, we can kind of sort of um, cache that, you know, a typical hierarchical cache. Yeah. No, go for it. Yeah, so we designed this originally for our encrypted our encrypted file system. So I've maintained, you know, we do quite a bit in the open source. I've maintained uh, EcryptFS for about five years. It's a, it's a stacked file system in the Linux kernel. It's used by Ubuntu and Chrome OS and various other. Yeah, yeah it's 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 really interesting, and it's it actually forms the heart of. Well, we actually support deencrypt and EcryptFS, but those two form the the heart of our. Encrypted file system solution. The thing that's never been available in uh, in pure open source has been the key management aspect. And so, uh, Gazang was originally uh, funded and founded based on the concept of there's more encryption that needs to be done in uh, first relational databases and now NoSQL and, and cloud uh, file systems. Um, the missing piece for actually getting all that to work is it, encrypting is easy. Where do you put the keys and be able to reboot your your system? Um, and so what we what we have are a set of init scripts and upstart jobs that at boot time will go out and fetch the, the keys necessary to mount your file system. And you can put a trustee on it so that at two in the morning when your your web server reboots, 
um, this, your system administrator might get a, 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 a message on their Z Trustee mobile app that says, do you want to approve this request? And it might be up to him or her to make a couple of phone calls and make sure that this is uh, you know, expected, and if so, approved, and no one has to log in anywhere. Oh, and by the way, that sysadmin didn't actually have uh, the private certificate uh, or the, the private password. All they did was, you know, authorize the release of that to a system that maybe, you know, your separation of duties are such that they don't have root on that box. You know, they have the right and the responsibility to release the private cert to that machine that's required to mount the file system, but they don't actually have access to that that system. So we originally built this to solve our own our own problem of we need to store keys that you need to you need to have at boot time. Um, our first few customers uh, grokked the concept and said, "Yeah, but I want to store my other keys in that." Yeah, but my HSMs are really expensive. Uh, yeah, but I can't get an HSM into the public cloud. Um, and that's where we we started expanding this concept uh, and and built something that was more general purpose. It works well, and we're sort of our first own customer for this. Um, any of our encryption customers are also customers of, of ZTrustee, but it's, it's also general purpose. Yes. Yeah, sure. No, I, 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 I must have been. I, I probably didn't didn't make that transition smoothly. It's a different approach to the to the same problem. I probably didn't make that transition seamlessly enough. Uh, enough. I, I didn't want to spend this entire hour talking about uh, you know Z Trustee all by itself. This is multi-factor authentication in the cloud. So the TO, yeah, the TOTP based stuff works really well, especially for the services um, where humans are involved. So that's kind of that's kind of this slide is. It's uh, the TOTP stuff is easy when you can have one of these things in your pocket, but a bit more difficult when you're talking about a machine to a machine. And in fact, I didn't, I haven't done a full um, a dissection of the Z Trustee protocol, but in fact, inside of every single Z Trustee uh, message, in addition to being signed and encrypted, there's also a sequence number. Uh, it's, it's not even a, a sequence number, it's a randomly generated uh, code that the server and the, the client exchange. So that if that client is duplicated somewhere else, then the somewhere else hijacks that connection, and now it's that it's considered that client. And the, 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 it's trying to prevent multiple Z Trustee clients from authenticating and and you know. You, you need to know the shared secret, but yeah, or be able to calculate. Yeah. Really? Okay. I've used uh, Authy and I've used uh, Google Authenticator from time to time. I try Google Authenticator on all my Google accounts uh, all the time, and man, that's a lot of uh, go to Google Authenticator and get me your, your code. Uh, if you're a Google Docs user, you're uh, you know have multiple devices. Um, you can tune it down to only on logins, which is where I'm I'm at now. So when a new device or a new device logs into the, the a Google service, you got to type it in. And hopefully your phone's nearby and not out of battery. En enabling it from a programmatic sense. And extending the concept from just authentication to authorization. Am I allowed to? Right. Is this process allowed to retrieve this bit of, of information? Um, and 
do does everyone or everything agree that it can be uh, the idea is that other sources other trustees would be privy to information that uh, is not readily available outside conditions are we under terrorist attack if so stop uh, you know, releasing releasing keys, release, releasing series, uh, certificates, and maybe not terrorist attack. But am I under a DDoS right now? If so, let's you know, let's let's halt the release of, of these. Have I de decommissioned this this um, this system? Right. So Jamalto has a lot of products, and they're definitely in the physical product space, uh, especially from the smart cards. They make a, a, a bunch of smart cards. So one of the um, they've got a couple of the original inventors of the smart chip technology. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure which one you're talking about. The, this this rotating token one is essentially the same thing as the, the RSA Secure ID. Um, on the IAM side of things. That's it, it's certainly a, an interesting extension to AWS, where um, you can give users roles who are allowed to be and, and not do certain things. That's baked deep into AWS, and if you're an, an AWS security conscious, uh, you know, heavy user, it's a great thing to to use. Um, but you know, AWS is relegated to explicitly public cloud, and not if you need to do things internally. They Amazon AWS. Yeah, so it's a if you if take a look at the AWS multi-factor off, um, it, it's it's interesting. It's it's useful. Yep, inside of Amazon or Rackspace, OpenStack, private cloud, public cloud, physical servers, software. Um, our virtual machines. Um, yeah. We do, I mean, most of our, our I'd say, you know, there's a vast number of customers using this in Amazon, but uh, there's plenty of opportunity out there elsewhere, and so we try to take a, a bit more agnostic approach. Mm hmm. We, we tend to run an enterprise. Um, yeah, if it's Linux, yeah, we're, we're happy to encrypt it. Um, we don't do a lot in Windows. Uh, TrueCrypt and BitLocker have that, that market pretty well under control. But um, if it's Linux, we can, we can certainly encrypt it. The vast majority, 98% of our customers are, are running in server environments. Um, but there's a few there's a few desktops out there, um, and if it's I mean I I, I co-authored the Ubuntu encrypted home directory um, feature, so the checkbox encrypt my home directory uh, that, that's that's something that uh, is near and dear to my heart. It's not something that Kazang does. Now there's there's a bit of work that goes behind that, and and most of it's in the Pam stack actually, and uh, Pam EcryptFS. Uh, captures your, your password that you enter, it decrypts, symmetrically decrypts a ran, long random passphrase that was generated at, uh, at setup time. Um, that's used to mount, or that, that's loaded into the Linux kernel's key ring. Actually, we TV KDF to it, so we hash it 65,000 times, loaded into the kernel key ring. If you have file name encryption, 
enable, we hash it one more time, and then that key is used for the file name encryption. Um, and then we mount home.ecryptfs slash username on top of your home directory. And the, the timing has to be done exactly right and at the right place and as the right user to set that up properly. So there's a set UID binary um, mount.ecryptfs private that takes care of that and gets the ordering and the, the locks and the race conditions down right. And that there are a few bugs to, uh, I had to fix along over the years. Uh, but it, it's, it's right now. <laughs> Um, and it, it mounts that on top of your home directory. And then to you, the user, it is Magic Fairies taking care of the encryption uh, in the background. Um, but it's ensuring that to application space, to GNOME or Unity or you know, whatever your app, uh, you know, Eclipse or Terminal or Firefox or Chrome, whatever's writing files and directories, it's just writing files and directories to what it looks like to be a, a, a normal file system. What actually lands on disk, each individual file is, is encrypted. encrypted and encrypted using a, its own randomly generated key, such that two files with identical clear text encrypt to completely different cipher text. Um, and yeah, that's all built into EcryptFS. It's per file encryption. There's also DMCrypt, which does block level encryption. It's a lot more performant, but it's a lot less flexible. You have to encrypt an entire block device. It has to be a file or a partition or a disk or a loop file. Um, and there's only one key for that entire file system, as opposed to EcryptFS, each individual file can be encrypted differently. Yeah, I mean, the, the single point of failure in any encrypted file system is the, the key that's used to, to, um, to, to do that mount. So in the Ubuntu encrypted home, there's a file called um, slash home dot encrypt fs slash um, dot uh, username slash dot encrypt fs wrapped dash passphrase. And that wrapped passphrase would be your, in that case, your single point of failure. Um, that passphrase, couple, that, that encrypted file, symmetrically encrypted file, coupled with your passphrase, is that single point of failure. Uh, to mitigate that, you could put that file on a USB key and put a sim link to the USB key so that it has to be plugged into the system whenever you type it in. That's a form of multi-factor auth. You have to know the passphrase and have the passphrase file and remove that. And that, that works well enough and um, keep it on a USB key. And, that, and don't lose the key. That's easy to do when it's this physical, and that that that's the whole point. And what I said, you know, trying to take us from um, really straightforward to really difficult. When it's a physical computer and it's a USB key that I plug in or or don't plug in, that's quite doable. When it's the cloud, I can't plug in a USB key to the cloud, but I still want to move that key off of the system and store it somewhere secure. And that's the the Z trustee. So I'd say the 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 other half of that is. The single point of failure is the key that's used to mount that file system, storing it somewhere else and retrieving it on, on, on use, and then protecting that retrieval uh, using the policies, the trustees or something like that. So I'll be, I'll be around to talk about this more. Thank you very much for, uh, for staying. Right, thanks. <laughs>